Are you a big brain or do you have one in your life? Let everybody know with our new podcast merchandise. Visit our new website, bigbrains.uchicago.edu to shop for a variety of gifts, from coffee mugs to throw pillows to decals. Know that when you make a purchase, you're helping support the podcast. Use promo code BRAINS21. Approximately 40% of us will be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetimes. The race to find a cure has been running for so long that the phrase, a cure for cancer, has become somewhat of a cliché. But in the last few years, a new way of finding cancer has started to bring us closer to being able to use that word seriously. It's called immunotherapy. So this it's not a miracle cure for cancer, but for specialists and patients alike, this is a remarkable moment in time. Now, a blockbuster series of studies is finding these drugs could change the way most lung cancer patients are treated. The emerging field of immunotherapy and its potential to help fight cancer in some patients. As promising as immunotherapy is, it comes with potentially disastrous side effects and only works for a minority of patients. Far from a cure. But two scientists here at the University of Chicago are changing all that. What we're trying to do is develop new technologies, which then leads to new patents, new intellectual property, new commercialization efforts, where you can move forward from A all the way down the road to Z someday. The idea is not to find a particular, just to say this is a cure, but coming up with new ideas that could help those people and make different types of immunotherapies for different types of cancers. That's Jeffrey Hubble and Melody Schwartz. They're professors at the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago, and they're re-engineering how the medical field thinks about and uses immunotherapy. They've even developed something called a cancer vaccine. I would say it's very different than anything else that's out there. So this is more, um, we're trying to not hit it so much with a sledgehammer, but try to fine tune and understand what helps drive um, a broader and long lasting immune response. And so that's what our vaccine is more focused on as opposed to other approaches. They may not use the word cure, but if there's going to be one, this seems pretty darn close. Hope springs eternal. It does. <laughs> From the University of Chicago Podcast Network, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, the power of immunotherapy in the fight against cancer. I'm your host, Paul Rand. Swartz and Hubble are developing exciting new ways to eliminate cancer, but their approach is unique. They don't think like doctors. I was actually pre-med and when I started undergrad, but I pretty much hated molecular biology. They think like engineers. I just like taking things apart and you know seeing how things work, how things fit together, and how we can understand something from many different angles. They're a married team, but each has their own lab at the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering that focuses on molecular engineering and immunoengineering, basically approaching the body more like a machine and designing ways to tinker the parts to make the system work better. We've really tried to establish research groups that focus on new molecules, new materials, new quantum uh, materials and quantum information processing approaches for other parts of the PME, so that new enabling technologies, but that can be translational, meaning I can turn it into some clinical impact or societal impact or technological impact. This engineering mindset may be exactly what cancer research needs. Engineers are trained to think about problem solving. You know, you learn approaches and tools and methods, and it teaches you also to think about a complex system. When I, when I look at problems like in physiology or in immunology, immunophysiology, really, I guess that, that has to do with where and when in the body things are taking place and how, it, it's perfect for an engineer to look at that because I think we're asking questions that are different than those that a cancer biologist or an immunologist would ask. This, this might come out the wrong way, but I think being ignorant about a field, it's easier to question uh, like dogmatic assumptions when you're slightly ignorant because you don't have any pre-existing idea about how things are supposed to be. I, I actually think that if, if, if some ignorance is helpful here, I think I could be brilliant in your field. <laughs> well, you know how sometimes just asking a question and when you don't know anything, it sometimes could be a really important question that everybody took for granted. So let's start with the right questions. What is the immune system? 
On a simple level, it's your body's system for fighting off invaders, like an internal police force. But to understand immunotherapy, we have to go much deeper. Our immune system is uh, kind of divided into two parts. One that responds very quickly, for example, to infection, and one that responds a little bit more slowly, but a lot more specifically. So the very quick system is called the innate immune system, and it's evolved to recognize bacteria and fungi and certain parasites, organisms that divide really quickly so that you need to respond to them really quickly before they kill you. The more sophisticated response, for example, the one to, that occurs to, uh, to viruses like we're all thinking about right now, is called an adaptive immune system. And it takes some days to respond, but it responds with great specificity. So that response, for example, against a flu virus would be different than response against a COVID-19 virus. And the system is made up of different kinds of cells that all play a different role. Uh, there are uh, cells called antigen-presenting cells that are patrolling, doing surveillance, looking for non-self constantly. Non-self. It basically means anything that isn't considered part of your body. These antigen-presenting cells are like detectives trying to discover evidence of a problem and bring that back to something called T-cells. And T-cells, or T-lymphocytes, are really one of the main agents, the main actors in that adaptive immune response. A certain class of those T-cells has the ability to kill other cells that are infected or they're mutated. They can recognize signals presented on those cells and they kill them. Those are called cytotoxic T-lymphocytes. Uh, or CTLs, they are what we're particularly interested in in cancer immunotherapy because they have the, the capability to kill cancer cells that possess these mutated proteins. Ideally, our immune system would identify cancer as a foreign agent and take it out. But there's one big problem. Because cancer is a corruption of our own bodies, our own cells, the immune system can't always see it almost like it's wearing a disguise. There are off signals on healthy cells to educate T cells that this is self, that this, this protein or this target is self. Those are mediated by immune checkpoints, ways that either the normal cells of the body like, well, like healthy cells or a mutated cell like a tumor cell, unfortunately, communicates to a T cell to say, hey, I'm self. So in, in cancer, that normal mechanism gets hijacked such that then successful cancer cells express a lot of these checkpoint molecules to tell in a dishonest way, in a tricky way, to tell the T cell that, hey, I'm normal self, but in fact, it's not normal self. And this is what cancer immunotherapies try to fix. So cancer immunotherapy is anything that would activate your immune response to recognize and kill or help the immune system kill tumor cells. Like a training program for your immune system. So that's the goal of cancer immunotherapy. And it can be done in a lot of ways. So one approach that we're exploring is to deliver to tumors agents that amplify the immune system, that amplify the response of these antigen presenting cells so that they collect these mutated proteins from the tumor and then present them to T cells in a way that's, that is more immunogenic. That's education. Some immunotherapies focus on the T cells, like CAR T cell therapy. You can inject T cells that are taken from your body, engineered to be hyper aggressive, recognize your tumor, and then they re-inject it back in your body and then they fight the tumor. Or you can focus on the checkpoints, what cancer uses to disguise itself. The more broadly used immunotherapies would be these checkpoint blockade agents or checkpoint inhibitors. Those are by and large antibody drugs, so protein drugs that recognize a target in an extremely specific way and can get in the way, can just block it, block it mechanically. So there are antibodies that have developed have been developed to checkpoint molecules with names like Program Death 1 or Program Death Ligand 1, very interesting names, and they block that blocking response. So they block the ability of the tumor cell to trick the T cell into thinking that, it, that it's not mutated after all. Immunotherapy has been one of the most exciting advancements in cancer research in decades. Since winning the Breakthrough of the Year Award from Science Magazine in 2013, it's also been named the Advanced of the year by the American Society of Clinical Oncology, twice. But as mentioned earlier, it's not without its downsides. There are, these checkpoint blockade agents are, are prone to cause autoimmunity. I, I mentioned that it's uh, these checkpoints are one of the ways that we don't develop autoimmunity in the first place. So there can be patients with like an under, uh, underlying um, inflammatory or autoimmune bias 
that get pushed over an edge and become autoimmune. Or even in, in, in patients that don't have that underlying bias, autoimmune-like responses can occur. And so if you were to make the analogy of immune suppression to prevent organ transplant rejection, for example, somebody might be on immune suppressants, that makes their whole entire immune system suppressed. So checkpoint inhibition is like the opposite of that, right? So your, your immune system is at a heightened state of activity, but not specifically only against tumors, but against anything else too. So for example, there are cases of, of uh, type 1 diabetes that occur in adults because of treatment with these drugs, that it turns on autoimmunity in the pancreas or more problematically, inflammation in the liver. So autoimmune-like responses in the liver that lead to sometimes dose-limiting toxicity. And there's another problem. So these checkpoint blockade uh, agents, these checkpoint inhibitors, uh, really, really well, but unfortunately in a minority of the cases. Don't get me wrong, if I had cancer, I would want to be treated with one as, you know, as, uh, as well as I could. And why is it that it's only a minority? It only works on tumors where there's already immune recognition and there's already T cells inside that tumor. And so all it does is boost their activity. So if, if the tumor is never recognized by the immune system in the first place, then boosting the T cells isn't going to necessarily do anything. So that's what we mean by an inflamed tumor. So inflamed tumors respond well, but poorly inflamed tumors don't respond well. But Swartz's and Hubble's labs have come up with unique solutions to this problem. So what we're doing is trying to develop molecular therapies to enhance tumor inflammation, to take a, a poorly inflamed tumor and to make it strongly inflamed tumors. Okay. So you're affecting the tumor so that the immunotherapy that exists would actually work on it in the way it works for all other people. That's right. So there are uh, classes of molecules that are immune regulators called cytokines and a particular subclass of that called interleukins. So these interleukins are, are, are partly the way that, that immune cells communicate with each other to turn down immunity, to recruit immune cells, to activate immune cells, to make immune cells proliferate and grow. Uh, so what we're doing is we've engineered or developed an engineering approach for these cytokines, these interleukins, to make them accumulate in tumors to be more effective in the tumor simply because they stay there longer. In some of our mouse modeling, some of our animal studies, we see very strong monotherapy efficacy. So meaning where there was enough immune activation going on that we simply have to push it over, over an edge and, and we can do that. In other tumors, it's beneficial to have these checkpoint inhibitors on board as well. So the work then that you guys are working on is, is how do you tap into this immunotherapy so that it actually uh, helps them flame the tumors and makes them accessible to the, the treatment, but also without the side effects, if I'm understanding it right. That's right. Also with lowered side effects. So drug developers refer to a, a therapeutic index or a therapeutic window. So meaning a drug level or an activity level that's high enough to be effective, but not so high as to be toxic. So one of the things that we've seen that we can do in our preclinical studies is lower the doses of some of these important agents so as to have a more tolerable toxicity profile, but still a very beneficial uh, efficacy profile. This isn't the only new immunotherapy breakthrough they've engineered. Two years ago, Hubble's lab devised a unique immunotherapy that uses the tumor's own collagen against it. Yeah, so all tumors uh, exist of tumor cells in what's called the stroma, the, the, the stuff that the tumor lies upon. And that stroma has a lot of protein component in it, including collagen. Collagen is the main structural protein of the skin, of tendon, of ligaments, of bone, and also the main structural protein of, of tumors. So when a, when a drug enters a tumor, it enters the tumor because the vasculature in the tumor is a little bit leaky. And so the drug leaks out of the vasculature into the tumor. The problem is it leaks into the tumor and then it leaks out of the tumor. So it's not present in the tumor particularly long. So what we've done is, is develop a molecular engineering approach where we have the agent, like the cytokine, bind to collagen in the tumor, which is everywhere in the tumor, so that when it leaks out, it gets hung up and retained in the tumor for prolonged periods of time. This allows us to use then doses in the bloodstream that are infrequent because doses in the tumor itself could be prolonged and, and thus uh, present in much, much, uh, much more effective manner. Not to be outdone, Schwartz's lab this year developed an incredible immunotherapy called a cancer vaccine, which may provide all of the benefits of immunotherapy without the downsides. And while she won't call it a breakthrough, I'm not sure what else it can be called. 
you know, every, everything is just a little step. So I don't really, I don't know, breakthrough is not a word I would use. The more we do, the more we try things in humans, the more we learn and the more we can fine tune things. And the, I hope that this could become something that was, would not only be feasible, but if it, if it shows good efficacy, I think it could also be quite inexpensive as a cancer immunotherapy. So it could be more accessible to more people. That, I'll say it, breakthrough treatment after the break. With inflation in the U.S. at its highest point in 30 years and the great resignation causing uncertainty for employers, what's the future of the global economy in 2022? Find out on January 12th at Economic Outlook Chicago, a hybrid in-person and virtual event hosted by the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Chicago Booth professors Austin Goolsby, Randall Krosner, and Raghuram Rajan will discuss inflation, labor markets, and the future of the global economy with moderator Kathleen Hayes. Join us to get expert insights from these renowned economists. Register at chicagobooth.edu slash EO. Like our immune system, we've all become intimately familiar with vaccines over these last two pandemic years. During the same period, Swartz had her own vaccine breakthrough, but not for viruses, but for cancer. And so just like a normal vaccine, you know, you, you might have a killed virus, like you might have like attenuated virus, like a, every year the flu, you know, or some known antigens that are from that particular thing. And then you present it to the immune system and you let them get educated on that. And then they'll go and kill the tumor. Schwartz's cancer vaccine is one of a kind, and it could be a massive development in cancer research. But to understand it, we need to know about another system beyond the immune system. That's the lymphatic system. So lymphatic vessels were long considered just to be the drainage system of the sewer system, you can say, of your body. And they were considered not that important. So they're vessels throughout your body. They drain fluid. And interestingly, they pass through lymph nodes. And, you know, lymph nodes are where immune responses are initiated. Strangely enough, when I started in this field, nobody was even asking, like, how do lymphatics contribute to immunity? They're clearly part of the immune system. But that wasn't even explored incredibly. But when Swartz's engineering brain looked at the lymphatic system, it started to piece things together. So while lymphatics drain fluid, they also are the main route for immune cells to go from a tissue into the lymph nodes. And so the T cells use lymphatics to traffic, but the lymphatics also can um, attract the T cells. And in tumors, one of the main findings we have is that when the tumors engage lymphatics, it also makes the tumor much more attractive to T cells. So if the lymphatic system is the drainage network your immune system uses to get around, what happens when a tumor gets its cells into the pipes? Well, now it has access to the entire body. One of the paradoxes of lymphatics in a tumor microenvironment, they're always considered bad. All right, if you have lymphatic involvement, that means the tumor can induce lymphatics to grow into it. They can activate the lymphatics. Um, that's always associated with metastasis. Metastasis, when your body develops tumors in secondary locations when it spreads. And so there have been so many clinical studies show, showing that in melanoma and carcinoma and so many you know, soft tissue cancers that involving lymphatic vessels is correlated with metastasis, correlated with poor survival. The more lymphatic vessels around a tumor, the worse prognosis for the patient. So lymphatics are bad for cancer, right? And it's it's kind of assumed that that's been because they're an escape route. But like, you know, the, in, the lymph node is where they escape to, and the lymph node is where all of your adaptive immune responses are mounted. So it was always very puzzling to us why lymphatics would be a, a hospitable place for tumor cells to disseminate, to move to other places. You know, you don't escape to the police station. And that's a really like lame analogy, but so they're sort of playing on both teams. If only there were a way to get the good of lymphatics without the bad. So the thing is that we figured out a way to turn that into a therapeutic by taking the tumor biopsy or tumor cells from surgery, making them express a growth factor that will attract the lymphatics. That's considered normally bad, right? But we then, irradiate the cells so they can't divide so they're essentially like a dead they're almost dead they're dying then we inject them somewhere completely remote 
anywhere really that has nothing to do with the tumor. Yeah, like like a vaccine. You know, you just it's exactly like a normal vaccine. It'd be like a flu vaccine. You take the flu, you make it so that it's not infective. You know, you make the virus attenuated or killed, and then you inject it with something called an adjuvant, which helps boost the immune response. And that's exactly what we're doing. But our vaccine, our tumor vaccines, are engaging the lymphatic system to bring broader and stronger immune response. Engaging the lymphatics makes the response to the tumor even more powerful than many other immunotherapies. But what about the threat of metastasis? Well, like with other vaccines, the immunity to the cancer would be systemic, meaning it would actually spread throughout the entire body. So if the cancer metastasizes somewhere else, the T cells generated by Schwartz's vaccine could still find it and kill it. So this approach of harnessing lymphatics that's completely new. There's there's no therapy. You know, you doing this to help boost an immune response, this is a, a completely new concept. It's important to note that Swartz's cancer vaccine is still awaiting clinical trials, but the idea alone is a massive upgrade for immunotherapy. Remember all those dangerous side effects of our other therapies? Well, you wouldn't have them with hers. The difference in having a cell therapy where it's a vaccine it's actually much, much easier because you're, first of all, you're not taking out precious cells that you need, you're taking out tumor cells. So the, these are gonna be taken out anyway, right? They're during the surgery or during a biopsy. And then you're irradiating them. So they're not even a, barely, they're, they're dying slowly over a period of two weeks. And, and then you're injecting them in a, like as a vaccine, like intramuscularly. So in terms of safety, it's much less risky than CAR T cell therapy because you're only using your own tumor cells to educate the immune system. And you're also only educating T cells against your tumor cells. So you're not going to, you know, you're not going to have these side effects that you would have with drugs or therapies that boost your immune system everywhere. Not only would it be safer, but you also fix the second problem with other immunotherapies. Her vaccine could also work with any kind of cancer inflamed or not because you're using your own tumor cells it could theoretically work for any you know we have to obviously test everything but it could work for any type of cancer but it still gets better we did studies to show that it was very long lasting because um, some of the mice they were basically cured <laughs> and then COVID hit and then we found like a year later we realized there were still some that were still in their cages and so they were old and they still didn't have cancer and then we re-challenged them with tumor cells and they completely killed, you know, the immune system completely killed this new rechallenged tumor cell a year later. Wow. So yeah, we were very excited that this worked so well and it had such a robust and also a long lasting immune response. And that's something that is also, I think, needs to be more focused on in the whole area of cancer immunotherapy. A lot of it is aimed at just hitting it as hard as you can, activating your T cells as much as you can just to be as aggressive. But um, but then these these T cells can just flame out. If you know they can be overactivated and then they die off and then you don't have any memory uh, recall response. You can also have situations where if you don't completely eradicate every tumor cell, then they can grow back and be even more aggressive. I think it could also be quite inexpensive as a cancer immunotherapy, so it could be more accessible to more people. So you're hoping now that you're going to take this and you're going to be able to go into human clinical trials. Is that right? That's the hope. Schwartz and Hubble's research is groundbreaking, and they've both expanded their discoveries beyond just cancer. Immunotherapy can be used to fight all kinds of diseases, and Hubble has an immunotherapy that he thinks could cure MS, multiple sclerosis, and that therapy is already in clinical trials. Yeah, that's uh, the field of immunological tolerance. Uh, so in a vaccine, we try to induce an immune response. We are also working on what are called inverse vaccines. So meaning we, we still have a bit and piece from a, that, that would be pathogenic, but we, we want, instead of to induce a response, we want to induce a regulatory immune response, uh, uh, educate the, the immune system to say, hey, this is self. So for example, in multiple sclerosis, where we have uh, our partners are with clinical trials with our technology, in clinical trials with our technology. So there we say, in multiple sclerosis, we kind of know what proteins a patient has developed autoimmunity to. That's really reasonably well characterized based on mechanistic studies over the last decades by other investigators. So then could we take those proteins and rather than vaccinate, could we inverse vaccinate against those proteins to turn on regulatory immunity? 
So there uh, we've did, we developed technique, technology that's still molecular engineering technology in the laboratory to ask, instead of how do you deliver those molecules with a signal of danger, how do you deliver them with a signal of self to educate the body, the immune system to say, hey, these are self. So right now, so we've, we're fortunate to have our technology in, in clinical trials in multiple sclerosis and in clinical trials in another disease, celiac disease. Our, our objective is to cure the disease. So a vaccine prevents disease for a long time, meaning there's memory to the vaccine. So we've shown in our, in our small animal studies that there is also memory to these inverse vaccines, meaning you learn that there's self, and then you remember that that is self instead of something foreign. We may need to boost a patient that we don't yet know. That takes more clinical studies to come to understand. But yeah, we do indeed hope to be able to cure these diseases. Big stuff. Hope springs eternal. It does. <laughs> it's, yeah, we, we, we come up with ideas in the laboratory. We, we work hard to test and try to get proof of concept. But then the proof of the pudding is in the clinic. Brains is a production of the UChicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap. Thanks for listening.